In his book, Human Aggression, the psychologist Anthony Storr wrote the following. The somber fact is that we are the cruelest and most ruthless species that has ever walked the earth, and that, although we may recoil in horror when we read in newspapers or history books of the atrocities committed by man upon man, we know in our hearts that each one of us harbors within himself those same savage impulses which lead to murder, to torture, and to war. These savage impulses, which lurk within the hearts of men, are the result of the shadow side of human nature. The shadow is a concept in Jungian psychology, which poses a considerable challenge for society and for the individual. As Jung writes, the shadow is a living part of the personality, and therefore wants to live with it in some form. It cannot be argued out of existence or rationalized into harmlessness. This problem is exceedingly difficult because it not only challenges the whole man, but reminds him at the same time of his helplessness and ineffectuality. The shadow archetype is a complex phenomenon which has met with some misunderstanding in recent years. Jung described the shadow as the whole of the personal unconscious, while at the same time describing it as an archetype of the collective unconscious. In order to fully comprehend the phenomenology of the shadow, this video will be broken down into five parts. Fear of the unknown, social conditioning and repression, the beast within, shadow projection, and integration. Part 1. Fear of the Unknown As with all of the videos in my archetype series, it is valuable to examine the evolutionary origins of the archetype and see how it fits into human biology. Careful observation has shown us that the shadow archetype emerged from primate social dynamics. The dual nature of man, writes Anthony Stevens, can be understood as a direct consequence of the evolution of territorial social groups, the survival of which has always depended on patriotism, i.e. love of one's own land and people, and hostility for the rest. All animals have an instinctual aversion to things which are perceived to be unfamiliar, a fear which we can call the fear of the unknown, and this fear allows them to avoid potential dangers. Having this cautious attitude also applies whenever one group encounters an unknown group, as primates are very mistrustful of outsiders. Animosity towards others evolved as a way to defend against those who may have hostile intentions, but it also evolved as a way to attack other groups in order to secure resources and territory. Thusly, aggression towards others is a trait which, in the wild, becomes naturally selected. This archetypal animosity divides a primate psychological worldview into us and them, as they treat their own troop as good and those belonging to other groups as evil, viewing them almost as though they were demons. Thus, the idea of the antagonist is archetypal. As Eric Neumann writes, People have always distinguished bad from good, as we have distinguished enemy from friend and strange from familiar, because as social mammals, we are programmed to do so. The idea of evil has its origins in the deep-rooted archetype of tribalism, as we instinctually trust those who are members of our own group, while hating those who belong to other groups, as Anthony Stevens explains. As social animals, we are programmed from a very early age to shrink from people whom we do not know, and stick to people whom we do know. This fundamental distinction between attachment and xenophobia is crucial not only for the preservation of the individual, but also for the survival of the group. Societies are closely integrated systems, each glued together by adherence to the familiar, all separated by hostility to the strange. While this archetype evolved as a way to identify and defend against potential enemies, human consciousness has resulted in a transformation of the archetype such that it can be utilized for another purpose altogether. Part 2. Social Conditioning and Repression With the birth of culture, human evolution proceeded in a completely different direction from the natural and instinctual life we had lived before. One of the ways in which members of a civilization can coexist is to impose certain rules and norms of behavior, while at the same time restricting behaviors which are deemed wrong. This fact means that certain ideas or traits are considered evil, while others are considered moral and virtuous. Standards of morality are different between different cultures, but whatever they are, they are promoted while immoral traits are condemned, sometimes under the threat of punishment. 
Rules such as the taboo against adultery, theft, or murder are necessary for a society to function, because without them, society breaks down. This also applies to basic social norms, which can be found in all cultures, which people are generally required to respect and obey. Otherwise, we may be deemed strange or antisocial. Thus, we are compelled to obey cultural rules, because we have a natural instinct to conform to the desires of the group, and hide parts of ourselves which may be deemed strange or unusual. For a modern example, if you listen to a genre of music which your peers dislike, you may be considered a strange person, and therefore may be compelled to hide this part of your personality, and instead listen to music which society finds more acceptable. Conformity is a natural tendency, since being rejected by the group can lead to social ostracism and alienation. The imposition of moral rules is part of the reason that we develop a conscious ego. The ego is who we perceive ourselves to be, and it is greatly influenced by societal expectations. Anything which is deemed acceptable by society is more likely to be a part of our self-image than those traits which are condemned by society. The image we hold of ourselves, however, can only be a relatively small and distorted picture, since we cannot be conscious of our entire personality. Furthermore, we may think of ourselves in a way which does not reflect reality. If we remember the archetypal foundations of the shadow discussed in part 1, we will note that we don't only apply the fear of the unknown to others, but also to ourselves, since our societally sanctioned ideas about morality cause us to repress or hide traits which are considered wrong and evil. Through societal rules and our own self-image, a substantial portion of the personality sinks beneath our conscious awareness, forming the shadow side of the psyche. In whichever culture a child grows up, it is usual, provided that he has been adequately parented, for him to identify his conscious personality with whatever the group holds to be good, and for his shadow complex to become the repository of all that is bad. Even if we try to get rid of traits which are considered evil, this only causes them to be repressed into the shadow. Removing a trait from awareness does not remove it from the psyche. Thus, everything we consider evil about ourselves continues to exist within us, but it becomes unacknowledged and regarded as not belonging to the self. This includes characteristics which are deemed immoral, such as excessive pride or lust, as well as things which we don't want to associate with our egos, such as inferiorities. Because morality differs from culture to culture, the shadow also differs. A substantial part of the shadow is the result of collective adaptation. It contains all those elements in the personality which the ego condemns as negative values. This selective valuation is collectively determined by the class of values current in the individual's culture canon. To the degree that his positive values are relative to a particular culture only, the shadow containing his negative values will be equally relative. By believing in a certain ideal of morality, we automatically condemn aspects of ourselves which do not fit with this conception, and so the shadow takes on those characteristics which the ego condemns. The ego thus represses its inferiorities, the traits which we don't want to associate with ourselves, creating a dark side which seldom becomes recognized, as Jung describes. This inferior personality is made up of everything that will not fit in with and adapt to the laws and regulations of conscious life. It is compounded of disobedience, and is therefore rejected not on moral grounds alone, but also for reasons of expediency. This is why the shadow is the archetype which is responsible for the existence of the personal unconscious. The desire to condemn evil causes us to condemn the evil within ourselves, leading to repression. The existence of a personal unconscious proves that contents of a personal nature which could really be made conscious, are being kept unconscious for no good reason. There is thus an inadequate or even non-existent consciousness of the shadow. The shadow corresponds to a negative ego personality, and includes all the qualities we find painful or regrettable. Part 3. The Beast Within Since consciousness can pick and choose which traits to acknowledge and which to hide, it is the light of consciousness which produces the darkness of the shadow. It was only recently discovered that mankind is a product of billions of years of evolution, and we carry this beast-like nature in the archaic portions of the psyche. Our unconscious animal-like nature influences our behavior to an enormous extent, 
and we can't simply repress it away. The dark tendencies of humanity ultimately arise from the fact that man is a beast, being forced to live in ways which do not necessarily accord with his inner nature. Even if we try to be good and moral, this dark side often forces its way into our lives, which is often why the most virtuous people carry the most darkness. However, evil is just the consequence of the fact that we are good and capable of genuine ethical behavior. In some ways, the shadow is not inherently evil, it is just nature. It is only evil because we have produced ideas about what it means to be good. How could one speak of good at all if there is no evil, or of light if there is no darkness, or above if there is no below? There is no getting round the fact that if you allow substantiality to good, you must also allow it to evil. If evil has no substance, good must remain shadowy, for there is no substantial opponent for it to defend itself against, but only a shadow, a mere privation of good. Oftentimes, the more we strive to be good, the more the dark side develops a desire to be evil. Caging up the inner beast only makes it more willing to lash out. For instance, we may suppress the anger we feel at work, only for this anger to explode unexpectedly in our home lives. Evil, however it is defined, is something which we frequently ascribe to other people, and not something which we recognize in ourselves. But the fact is, we all carry a shadow side, which thwarts our noble intentions, and we need to recognize our own capacity for evil. The beast within must be understood as a real and genuine danger. Mankind is the greatest threat which mankind faces, as we underestimate our own capacity for evil. The propensity for cruel, obscene, and brutal acts is in all of us. That it is usually not much in evidence in polite society is due to the supervision of the superego, which insists that it be kept hidden and under control, locked away in the shadow. But if we are honest with ourselves, we know that it is there, and the fear that it might somehow get out is one of the oldest fears to haunt mankind. Repression does not remove the shadow from the personality, since it is exceedingly difficult to change who we are at a biological level. Repression of the shadow causes these traits to sink beneath our conscious awareness, where they nevertheless return when we least expect them. For instance, the Christian condemnation of sexual activity outside of marriage may cause a person to repress their sexual desires, only for this biological trait to return and effectively override the person's consciousness, leading him or her to act against their own religious beliefs. Just as we fear the unknown outside, so too do we fear to encounter the unknown within. The shadow archetype, like all archetypes, results in symbols which demonstrate its psychological phenomenology. Early myths and religions contain references to demons and other evil spirits, who supposedly can possess us and cause us to do acts of evil. Such images are the result of the shadow archetype, which is felt almost as a demonic presence which takes over our lives and leads us against our moral beliefs. The ancient Greeks had the word akrasia to describe the state of someone who has lost their sense of self-control and felt themselves to be possessed by the will of an external force. Demons in religion and folklore are often depicted as grotesque and terrifying because the shadow is ascribed with the qualities of an evil, antagonistic entity. The shadow can behave in an almost autonomous manner, and the more we repress our inferior side, the more it fights back, which is where the idea of demon possession comes from. The educated man tries to repress the inferior man in himself, not realizing that by doing so, he forces the latter into revolt. Thus, using the ego as a mask to conceal our shadow characteristics, such as aggression, greed, or envy, does not cause these traits to disappear. But if the ego does not recognize these tendencies, where do they go? The answer leads us into one of the most dangerous psychological phenomena which the human species must grapple with. Part 4. Shadow Projection The ego generally holds itself in a high regard, and so does not accept the shadow as belonging to oneself. Instead, without being conscious of it, the shadow becomes projected onto others. We much prefer to entertain idealized images of ourselves, rather than acknowledge our personal weaknesses and guilt. It is much easier to blame others for our own shortcomings particularly if we can persuade ourselves that the blame is deserved. 
Shadow projection is an intractable vice of our species. It is at the bottom of all internecine strife and suspicion, all pogroms and wars. Since the shadow is geared for antagonism against perceived enemies, we often project our own inner unconscious evil and inferiorities onto other people, who we may begin to perceive as evil demons. We fail to see in ourselves what we readily find in other people, and we are more critical with others than we are with ourselves. It is rare that a person recognizes their own capacity for evil, as we tend only to recognize the evil which other people are responsible for. As such, it is immensely difficult for a person to accept their own dark side, since they are convinced that it is others, rather than themselves, who are truly evil. As Jung remarks, The darkness and evil have not gone up in smoke. They have merely withdrawn into the unconscious, owing to their loss of energy where they remain unconscious so long as all is well with the conscious. But if the conscious should find itself in a critical or doubtful situation, then it soon becomes apparent that the shadow has not dissolved into nothing, but is only waiting for a favorable opportunity to reappear as a projection upon one's neighbor. It is convenient for us to divide the world into good and evil, and place ourselves on the good side. But the world has never been this simple. Shadow projection is at the root of all wars and conflicts, and it is arguably the most dangerous psychological phenomena that we are capable of, especially if it occurs at a collective level. It is not just ourselves which we view in an excessively positive light, but people we consider to be part of our tribe, and hence we perceive the other side as demons who are responsible for all evil. It is the nature of political bodies to always see the evil in the opposite group, just as the individual has an ineradicable tendency to get rid of everything he does not know and does not want to know about himself by foisting it off on someone else. Our readiness to blame others for our problems is at the root of all conflicts and genocides, and demagogues use shadow projection to scapegoat entire races, religions, or political ideologies. Shadow projection is at the bottom of all racial and international prejudice, and our facility for turning our opponents into devils it explains the readiness with which we can convince ourselves that our enemies are not men and women like us, but monsters, unworthy of all humane consideration. There is only one thing to be done with such vermin, and that is to exterminate them, etc. Hitler's speeches were full of such talk, and it is clear that he, and through him, the entire German nation, collectively projected the shadow onto the Slavs and the Jews, whom they significantly termed Untermenschen, subhumans. Our obsession with making demons out of our foes actually causes our dark sides to be released, since people feel justified by fighting against perceived demons. The problem is that projection is caused by a failure of the person to critically reflect on their own personalities and to accept the shadow as belonging to themselves. Scapegoating other people is much easier since we can pretend to have the moral high ground. A great danger ensues whenever two groups regard each other as demonic as such a conflict can escalate rapidly, as history has too often demonstrated. One of the reasons it can be so difficult to accept the shadow side is because it can cause us to feel guilty. As Stevens explains, guilt and the fear that guilt induces are at the root of the shadow problem. That we go to such devious lengths as we do to keep the shadow unconscious is because conscious acceptance of one's own evil entails suffering one's own guilt and through that suffering, participating in the guilt of humankind. We are responsible for the state of the world and its future, not the previous generation, not the political left or right, but us, you and me. Shadow projection is very common, and we are all likely guilty of it, even when we are unconscious of the fact. Projection perpetuates a vicious cycle, which humanity has been experiencing since the invention of civilization. We naturally define good and evil, based on ideas which we condone and those which we condemn, and use these to build cultural values, societal norms, and societal taboos. By doing so, we discard parts of our personality which don't conform to the expectations of our social group, whether these traits are immoral or simply looked down upon. This evil does not escape, but is instead responsible for our dark tendencies, which, instead of accepting, we project onto other people and accuse them of evil. However, with the birth of the study of psychology, humankind has reached a point where it is possible to understand the dynamics of our evil side 
and escape this vicious cycle. But how can we remedy this societal problem? Part 5. Integration As opposite poles of the morality archetype, good and evil are ineradicable characteristics of the human condition. To pretend that we can embrace one and eliminate the other is to breed personal division and public disorder. Both individuation and planetary salvation demand that we be aware of our capacity for both good and evil, and that we make ethical choices between the two. It is vital for the preservation of peace, whether between neighbors or between nations, that we acknowledge the beast-like nature which all of us possess. This nature is the inheritance from our biological evolution, the residue of our striving towards morality. Our moral virtues can often be genuinely good, as humans have an astonishing capacity to love and to care for one another. In order to prevent the devil within from ruining our lives and the lives of those around us, we need to integrate it, which is not at all easy. If we are to survive, we have not only to own consciously the personal shadow, but we also have to assume both personal and collective responsibility for the archetype of evil. This is a moral task of such daunting stature as to be quite beyond the capacity of the great majority of humankind. The first thing is to realize the reality of the shadow. The shadow is only evil because of our capacity for good, and it is not inherently evil. Our biological makeup and animality is not our choice. It is something which we have no say in. It is therefore not a good idea to treat the shadow as an enemy, but more like an animal who is morally neutral, neither good nor evil. The second thing is to realize that what we call evil is so by designation. Evil is a serious problem for the human species, and so we need to be conscious of the beast within, and to recognize when and where it appears in our lives. When we discover our shadow sides, we need to channel it appropriately. For instance, aggression can be used for destructive or constructive purposes, depending on whether or not we become conscious of it. Consciousness of the shadow is the first step in subduing its power over us. There is an urgent biological imperative to make the shadow conscious. The moral burden of this immense task is greater than any previous generation could have even conceived. Being conscious of the shadow means withdrawing it from projections. Whenever you find yourself feeling hatred for another person, ask yourself why it is that you have such feelings, and what it is about the other person that makes you so mad. We often discover in others what we fail to see in ourselves. Knowledge of the shadow allows us to deal with it in a healthy way, while drawing our attention to traits which we may have been unaware of. What matters, after all, is not that we are aggressive, xenophobic, sexual, hierarchical, or territorial, but what conscious attitude we adopt to these fundamental a priori aspects of our nature, how we live with them, and how we mediate them in the group. It is the ethical orientation that counts. If we consciously accept our darker nature, it will not hold so much sway over us. The shadow is also a part of who we are, and we cannot be whole without this aspect. To love oneself is to love one's shadow, and to realize that the shadow itself is not evil, but our inability to channel it properly can be. A dim premonition tells us that we cannot be whole without this negative side. That we have a body which, like all bodies, casts a shadow, and that if we deny this body, we cease to be three-dimensional and become flat and without substance. Yet this body is a beast with a beast soul, an organism that gives unquestioning obedience to instinct. To unite oneself with this shadow is to say yes to instinct, to that formidable dynamism working in the background. Not all shadow traits pose so serious a danger. While there is much in the shadow which threatens society, some shadow traits are actually positive and can enhance our lives. If it has been believed hitherto that the human shadow was the source of all evil, it can now be ascertained on closer investigation that the unconscious man, that is, his shadow, does not only consist of morally reprehensible tendencies, but also displays a number of good qualities, such as normal instincts, appropriate reactions, realistic insights, creative impulses, etc. On this level of understanding, evil appears more of a distortion, a deformation, a misinterpretation, and misapplication of facts that in themselves are natural. Conformity causes us to repress traits, which are actually positive, 
in order to be socially accepted. But oftentimes, the prevailing moral or social systems are restrictive and prevent a culture from moving in new, life-improving directions. Thus, exploring the shadow can give us an opportunity to explore the rejected parts of ourselves, and what we discover may actually be quite remarkable. Seen from the one-sided point of view of the conscious attitude, the shadow is an inferior component of the personality, and is consequently repressed through intensive resistance. But the repressed content must be made conscious, so as to produce a tension of opposites, without which no forward movement is possible. The conscious mind is on top, the shadow underneath, and just as high always longs for low, and hot for cold, so all consciousness, perhaps without being aware of it, seeks its unconscious opposite, lacking which it is doomed to stagnation, congestion, and ossification. Life is born only of the spark of opposites. This spark of life may come in the form of creativity, since we need to defy cultural expectations in order to be truly creative. If we want to be ourselves, we need to reject the notion of social conformity and embrace who we truly are. Social conformity can also be dangerous and promote things which, when one strikes out against the norm, are revealed to be much more sinister and evil than they appear. The shadow, since it does not want to conform to any rules, can be used as an instrument to challenge social norms which may be outdated. Proper integration of the shadow is in the best interest of everyone, and only by doing so will we prevent conflicts and strife, both at the individual and collective levels. The person who has integrated his shadow has taken on a moral burden for the benefit of humanity, and has taken a courageous leap into the darkness by accepting his own evil and withdrawing it from others. If people can be educated to see the shadow side of their nature clearly, it may be hoped that they will also learn to understand and love their fellow men better. A little less hypocrisy and a little more self-knowledge can only have good results in respect for our neighbor, for we are all too prone to transfer to our fellows the injustice and violence we inflict upon our own natures. The development of our personalities can also be greatly enhanced by integrating portions of the shadow, which allows us to become who we truly are, rather than simply conforming to the expectations of others. Without some acknowledgement of the devil within us, individuation cannot proceed. Coming to terms with one's own evil is the first and indispensable stage in conscious realization of the self. True morality requires that the shadow achieve consciousness, because on that condition alone, can we become responsible for the events of our lives and render ourselves accountable for what we have projected onto others. Inasmuch as it enhances social responsibility, consciousness of the shadow benefits the group. Jung's work and the work of his successors sought to grapple with the philosophical challenge of good and evil. Jung himself witnessed the terrible evil which the human species is capable of and made it his life's mission to explore human psychology in order to help future generations avoid the same disasters which the shadow predicated. Each of us has a moral responsibility to confront our own darkness and face it with courage, and by doing so, promote love and peace. Such a man knows that whatever is wrong in the world is in himself, and if he only learns to deal with his own shadow, he has done something real for the world. He has succeeded in shouldering at least an infinitesimal part of the gigantic, unsolved social problems of our day. These problems are mostly so difficult because they are poisoned by mutual projections. How can anyone see straight when he does not see himself, and the darkness he unconsciously carries with him into all his dealings?